All right. How's it going? Eh? Eh? Are you a coffee in the morning kind of person? I am a coffee in the morning and in the afternoon kind of person. Why? <laughs> it was the first time I needed a coffee in the morning and I'm falling off right about, I fell off right about the end of your class. I uh -huh. lunch, started reading, <laughs> kind uh -huh. of fell off. Do you ever start reading aloud whenever you're falling off? Yes, actually. That, yeah. That, 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 yeah um, reading aloud does help me stay awake if I'm reading something that is um, putting me to sleep. <laughs> well, I, I, I'll definitely say I, I think I read aloud the entire thing. Okay. <laughs> not that I think it's not interesting. No, no. Yeah. It's interesting. Of course. Just falling off here. Go ahead. I gave up dark sodas. I've given them up for two months. Uh -huh. I'm giving up coffee for Lynn. So I'm, I'm struggling a little. <laughs> yeah, um, if, 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 I, like, um, if I was a person who gave things up for Lent, coffee would be an impossibility. <laughs> um, I, 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 would, I would probably, uh, um, yeah, I, I would last maybe a day or two. I, I think also like, my wife would probably forbid me from giving up coffee because that would be so bloody unpleasant. I drink a lot of hot tea, uh -huh. well sugared. That's, okay. That's <laughs> No, but I just I, I, I consume a lot of black coffee. All right, so let's dig into the fall of Gondolin here. What did you guys think of this? How's this going for you so far? I uh, read like a saga to me. Yeah. Okay. But not so much in the definitely not like a romance. Uh huh. Couple of romance. Okay. Because it, it didn't really go into too much detail of his adventuring. It was more of uh, when he got there, what he did. And then time passes again and again. So uh -huh. it will take you, um, take you through the same sort of route, and then out of the saga almost. Yeah, th th there are a couple of points where it's almost like Sir Gowan and the Green Knight, right? Where it's like, well, Tour had these adventures, but we're not going to tell you about those, right? <laughs> because we want to stay focused on the main plot line here, right? Which is the fall of this particular city, like the. There's no surprise here as to what's going to happen, right? It's right there in the title. I feel like it read more like someone took all the line breaks out of a poem or an epic and just okay. smashed it together. <laughs> yeah, in fact, um, one of the earliest form, in, in fact, one of the earliest forms this took, Tolkien actually was writing it in verse. Uh, if you had to compare this to something we've read before, Nick, you said this read kind of like a saga. Uh, what did it, of the things we've read so far, what did it seem most like to you? What did it seem most similar to? Like of all the things we read? Yeah. Well, it sort of began with uh, an exile. Okay. That's how it felt in the beginning. Mm -hmm. It was on his little adventure with on, um, with hard to pronounce name of the of the waters, okay, uh, helping him through his journey, uh -huh. leading him to uh, where we would find a band of gnomes trying to get to Gondolin. Yeah, only one gnome of that tribe of that crew survives, and after uh -huh. that he gets to Gondolin, and then it starts to read like a saga where. Uh huh. Uh, <clears throat> Tour became the the right hand of the king, married yep. the daughter of the mm -hmm. king. There was also Melgrim, he's there. Uh -huh. Melgrim, Melgrim. Uh -huh. <clears throat> and it, he, ha he has a son, he's only a babe right now, uh, and they're mounting an attack. Yeah, we have that, that Tour-Idril-Meglin triangle, right? Although, you know, no one actually likes Manglin. So. <laughs> okay. But yeah, um, so the, does this seem similar in some ways then, like, to the Volsunga saga? Similar in ways? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'd say so. I mean, it's very focused on, to the point of this certain person's adventure. Uh-huh. Instead of going deeply into what it was about. Because in a saga, 
it didn't go too deeply into a battle. It was just a battle was won by this yeah. party. And, and there, apart from vengeance, there's really little examination of personal psychology in the sagas, right? Like, we don't really get too much about what any character is thinking or feeling. We're just going to get, what, yeah, what, what, this is what they did, right? It's very much focused on action. Um, so, was there anything that really stuck, uh, stuck out to you guys uh, that you read so far? Like, any particular part that you really wanted to talk about that you had questions about? Turner's obsession with swans. Okay. Yeah, his his heraldic animal is the swan, right? Yeah. What do you think is going on there? I mean, swans are, you know, they're white and they're considered pure. Okay. Uh, they're perfection, essentially. Okay. What other ideas do we associate with swans? They're on the water. That's where he deeply wants to Okay. Be. They're water birds, yeah, and he has that sea longing, right? What else do we know about swans? What do we know about the mating habits of swans? They mate for life. Yeah, swans mate for life, right? So they are often associated with loyalty. Anything else that you happen to know about swans? Do they fly long distance? I think so. Captain Catch. <laughs> <laughs> he goes up a bunch of places, swans go south through the mm -hmm. What What does Tour spend a lot of his time doing when he's by himself? Playing music, yeah. Have you ever heard of the swan song? And not just the record label. Uh, that Led Zeppelin ran, uh, but uh, what, like what a swan song is. I think the term means like the last song. Yeah, we, we, we usually use it to refer to somebody's like, you know, goodbye performance, right? Um, and this comes from a legend uh, in which uh, a swan sings its most beautiful song before it dies. So a swan song, so swan, in this sense, is also representative in some way of endings. And one way in which, two, well, and I think we can read this in a couple of ways, right? What's one way in which Tuor is different from the people of Gondolin? He's man. He's human, right? So he's mortal. They are immortal elves. So the swan may in part be a reference to his own mortality, right? It could refer to the fact that he's a musician. Um, and uh, where else was I going with this? There was something else I had in my brain that <clears throat> has just entirely slipped my mind. So musician, mortality. Oh, also, what? What do we know is going to happen after Tuor comes to Gondolin? It's going to fall. It's going to fall, yeah. So he is, his coming is a kind of harbinger of the end of this city, right? So as valued and important as he becomes within Gondolin, right? Right, he comes carrying Olmo's message. Uh, you know, attack Melko, rescue the captive Noldoli, or your city's going to fall. And Turgon says, eh, city's not going to fall. <laughs> We're good. But, you know, hang out here, uh, have some weapons, marry my daughter, right? It'd be great. I've been here over 400 years with a city of stone to fly. Yeah. Yeah, City of Stone, right? In fact, God, yeah, Gondolin means, you know, st uh, the stone song, right, is, is what uh, we're told. Uh, all Gondolin's names, it has seven names. It has seven names, yeah, okay. Seven names of Gondolin. Now, I feel like that's significant, because there's seven names of Gondolin, and there's seven families, seven captains of those houses. 
Okay, yeah. Seven families, seven captains. And there's seven ball rocks. Ball, ball rocks. Ball rocks. And seven ball rocks. Ball rocks. Right, one for each captain, yeah. <laughs> conveniently. <laughs> um, so, apart from the fact that seven is a kind of symbolically significant number generally, right, it's, you know, um, it's, it's a prime number less than 10, um, you know, it's, uh, um, <clears throat> you know, seven virtues, seven deadly sins, all that sort of thing. I think in association with a city, what I think of are the seven hills of Rome, right? The seven hills on which the city of Rome is built. I'm not sure that this is exactly the right way to be thinking of this. I'm not sure this is what anybody had in mind, but this is what um, this is what it calls to mind to me, especially because you know this is a city that is carved out of hills and mountains. So. I don't know what you guys think of that reading, but uh, that's what it sounds like to me. What else did you guys want to talk or have questions about? I had to look up the word Nildoli. Okay. It wasn't, it wasn't clear to me at first. And I was like, oh, no. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so this is a word that disappears pretty quickly uh, from... Tolkien's mythos, right? Uh, he uses the term Noldol Noldolier gnomes only to refer to the group of elves that he will later call the Noldor. Now, I know that at least one of you uh, has some experience with Tolkien nerddom. Do you know what the Noldor are? Which kindred of elves we're talking about here? Drondo? No, not Okay, so um, I'm, I'm trying to go. Through no, it's, it's yeah, no worries, no worries. <laughs> <laughs> so um, according to Tolkien's broader mythology, which is still in its infancy when he writes *The Fall of Gondolin*, right? This is really kind of the first piece of it that he composes. So I think it's interesting that it actually starts with the destruction of a city, and we'll talk about why that might be in a moment. But essentially, the way his mythology develops, right? You have this. You have this awakening of the elves. Somewhere in Middle Earth, right? Somewhere off in the east. The elves are called by the valor, and he's like, they're not quite gods, but they're somewhere kind of between gods and angels. Um, they are called by the valor to go west. Across the sea. To the Undying Lands. Um, this actually seems to reflect a Celtic mythological motif. Right, where Tirnano, the land of the young, is off over the Western Ocean. So there are three kindreds of elves that make that trip. The Vanyar, who are in this simply called the Eldar. And the Vanyar are kind of light elves, right? You know, they stay in the Undying Lands. They don't come back to Middle Earth. They have really no place in the saga after traveling overseas. Uh, the Noldor are the second kindred. They're the ones that are here called Noldoli or Gnomes. And the Teleri or the Sea Elves who aren't mentioned here um, are the third kindred. Now, there are some elves who refuse to go, 
they become Thranduil's people in the Lord of the Rings. And there are others who make it about halfway and then become um, enraptured with Middle Earth and refuse to go any further. But yeah, so these are the three kindreds that go across the sea. Now the Noldor are craftsmen. And the greatest of their number, Fanor, creates um, a set of beautiful jewels, three beautiful jewels called the Silmarils. And the most powerful and also the most morally corrupt of the Valor, uh, who is here called Melko at this early stage, but later on will be called Melkor, and finally Morgoth, the Black Enemy, kills Feanor's father and runs off, with his, runs off to Middle Earth with the Silmarils. So the Noldor defy the Valor's orders, go back to Middle-earth uh, to fight Morgoth and to get the Silmarils back. So the Noldor and their struggles are the main topic of what Tolkien called the Quinta Silmarillion. Now, all of this is still sort of part of Tolkien's future conception, right? And at this point, the, Noldo the Noldoli or the gnomes are pretty much just elves with an affinity for earth and stone and metal. In fact, gnome in medieval alchemy is an earth spirit. He later um, abandons, the, um, he, it doesn't take him too long to abandon this name uh, in large part because it doesn't quite suit the kinds of beings that he is, he's conceived of here, right? Like it's hard, it's hard to say gnome and imagine these tall, beautiful, fairy-like beings, right? So does gnome, is it replaced by dwarves? Because I mean, the dwarves are craftsmen and earth. No, um, because he's using gnomes here, like the Noldoli mm -hmm. and the Gondoth, the, the people of Gondolin, they're the same peoples, okay. right? It's just that the, 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 there are the, the unfree Noldoli who've been captured by Melko, and then there are those who live in the city. So dwarves don't seem to enter into this. All of the, all of the characters apart from Tuor and Melko and his armies, well, and I guess Ulmo, the sea god who shows up, um, are, are elves, right? The vast majority of the characters in this are elves. Whatever, they, whatever they're called. Elves are elves, dwarves, <laughs> mortal. Mm -hmm. Even though I think they live longer than humans. Oh, much, yep. Dwarves, both craftsmen, these ones are closer to gods. These ones are closer to that kind. Yep. Yep. In fact, um, in the Silmarillion, uh, Tolkien um, comes up with a complete, like, elves and humans have a sort of common creation origin. Dwarves are the result of a completely separate creation by a separate being. So, <clears throat> this whole narrative of the Silmarils isn't really part of Tolkien's conception yet. This is something that he develops later on, using some of these characters and some of these ideas, right? Essentially, it's a means for getting elves from that other world of the Undying Lands back into the ordinary world. Now, at the time Tolkien was writing this particular piece, uh, he was on leave. Uh, he was convalescing after participating in the Battle of the Sun. So, how much do either of you know about the First World War? Um, Have you ever heard of the Battle of the Sun before? Yes. Okay. 
Is that about as far as your knowledge goes? Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Then it was a battle of the First World War. It's not okay. Really a big deal in public, uh -huh. public school education. <laughs> okay. Fair enough. So when you think of a battle, how long do you think a battle typically lasts? Weeks. It could be weeks. Could be months. months. Yeah. The Battle of the Somme um, took place over about half a year, right? So it begins on 1 July 1916 and ends on 18 November. So the Somme is a river in France. Um, there are three million combatants Right, that's um, French and British troops on one side, German and Austrian troops on the other, right? That's you know a total of three million people fighting. There are one million killed or wounded. So a third of the participants in this battle are casualties. British casualties on day one almost 60,000. And of those 60,000, again, about a third, about 20,000 were killed. This is still regarded as the deadliest battle in British military history. Right, highest casualty count. Now the other thing that makes this battle historically important, apart the fact that a million people were killed or wounded so that the French and the British could gain six miles of ground over about six months, is that this is one of the first really kind of theaters for mechanized warfare. In fact, this was the battle in which tanks were introduced. There are also aircraft. Long range machine guns in use. So this is very different from the style of warfare, the style of fighting um, that we see in romances and sagas, right? You know, this is much of it, you know, done at a distance, um, much of it done by machines. And Tolkien is wounded, uh, he's a signals officer, uh, so they often wanted to take the signal guy out um, as quickly as possible once he could be identified. Um, <clears throat> he's wounded fairly early in the conflict and sent home to convalesce. And this is what he writes while he is in hospital, uh, recovering from his experiences. Um, so to this mechanized warfare point, I want to turn to the description of the dragons on page 69. as Melko is preparing for war, right? Now the years fare by, and egged by Idril, too, or keepeth ever in his secret delving. But seeing that the leaguer of spies hath grown thinner, Turgon dwelleth more at ease and in less fear. So the language like, is all, you know, kind of archaic. Here, you know, it's meant to sound old fashioned, right? Yet these years are filled by Melko in the utmost ferment of labor, 
And all the thrall folk of the Naldoli must dig unceasingly for metals, while Melko sitteth and deviseth fires, and calleth flames and smokes to come from the lower heats. Nor doth he suffer any of the Noldoli to stray ever a foot from their places of bondage. Then on a time Melko assembled all his most cunning smiths and sorcerers, and of iron and flame they wrought a host of monsters, such have only at that time been seen and shall not again be till the great end. Some were all of iron so cunningly linked that they might flow like slow rivers of metal or coil themselves around and above all obstacles before them. And these were filled in their innermost depths with the grimmest of the orcs with scimitars and spears. Others of bronze and copper were given hearts and spirits of blazing fire. And they blasted all that stood before them with the terror of their snorting or trampled what so escaped the ardor of their breath. Yet others were creatures of pure flame that writhed like ropes of molten metal and they brought to ruin whatever fabric they came nigh, and iron and stone melted before them and became as water. And upon them rode the Balrogs in hundreds. And these are the most dire of all those monsters which Melko devised against Gondolin." Now, in terms of the narrative here, what kinds of, what, what are these things? He's talking about giant creatures of fire. Imagine uh -huh. stemming off of like, Tanks and war machines of yeah. yeah. Yeah, his original concept of dragons for his created mythology. Yeah, they're like tanks, aircraft, troop carriers, right? And they're not born, they're created, right? They're devised by his most cunning smiths and sorcerers. So at least in the earliest version of the Middle Earth mythology, dragons are machines. we go through and we look at much of the language associated with Melko and his servants, or even on the prior page, page 68, the Balrogs are described. Now these were demons with whips of flame and claws of steel. told earlier once I can find it at page uh, 53 how it came ever that among men the Naldoli have been confused with, with the orcs or Melko's goblins I know not unless it be certain that of, of the be that certain of the Naldoli were twisted to the evil of Melko and mingled, mingled among these orcs for all that race were bred by Melko of the subterranean heats and slime. Their hearts were of granite, and their bodies deformed. Foul their faces were smiled not, but their laugh that of the clash of metal. And to nothing were they more fain than to aid in the basest of the purposes of Melko. Their greatest hatred was between them and the Noldoli, who named them Glamhoth, or folk of dreadful hate. So the orcs are bred in pits. and are also associated with stone and metal. Um, did you notice what the name given to Melko's dungeons is? It's actually on the, the, the prior page, it's page 52. He holds the Noldoli who are within his power. Mm. 
The Hells of Iron. Hells of Iron, Sorry, yes. I was for it. It's okay, yeah. So what do we gather then about the villains in this story? What does Tolkien seem to be associating here with evil? Progress. Like, better fighting because he's using mm -hmm. metal and fire and coming up with these cutting machines to defeat yeah. stone. And uh -huh. obviously fire beats stone. <laughs> but it's hot enough to build. Yeah. Sorcery becomes engineering. Absolutely, yeah. So yeah, yeah, it, it, it's, it, yeah, um, I think what we're, yeah, what we're talking about here primarily is not so much better fighting, but technological warfare, yeah. right? Mechanized warfare, yeah. Things that kill great numbers of people from a distance. And yeah, even like the life forms that serve Melko, with the exception of the Noldoli that he's captured, seem mostly to be artificial in some sense, right? Yeah. I mean, they are artificial, they're not born, they're made. Yeah. Now, this is actually one of the thing that's, things that's gonna be a little bit problematic um, I think in Tolkien's work, when we start talking about the orcs in the Lord of the Rings, right? You know, notions of like, you know, to what extent do orcs have a sense of morality? Are orcs redeemable in any way? Like, are they naturally evil? Um, are they created beings or corrupted beings? You know, all that sort of thing, right? Now, here in this early phase, it seems pretty clear that they are created beings, right? Bred in these slime pits. That yeah, he says that they have no common origin with the Noldoli, right? I think the later story that develops is that they are corrupted elves. But here they are created by Melko in his breeding pits. Um, go ahead. The orcs later on in Lord of the Rings, aren't they? Sauron creates them. In uh, a way? No, um, I mean, orcs have existed, like, it, it, in the whole legendarium here, orcs have existed since the First Age. And Morgoth, which is that final phase name for the character who's called Melko here, um, is their creator. Well, not their creator. Um, the way um, Tolkien's mythology eventually ends up, right, is that evil can't create. It can mimic and it can corrupt, but it can't actually make anything. And this is um, a notion, I think, in Tolkien's mythology that hasn't quite developed yet in 1917. Because remember, like, you know, th th this, this is really kind of the foundation on which everything ends, else ends up being built, but there's still a lot more building to do here. So this is what Melko is all about, right? Let's look at what's opposed to Melko then. What's Tuor like? What do we note about Tuor? Like we've already, you know, done some kind of pulling out some things about him that are related to the swan, right? Mm Note about Tour. So he's a musician, right? And what are we told about his music? It brings a lot of animals together. Okay, yeah. Um, but people and animals come to listen to it, and he gets bored with that and leaves, right? <laughs> um, is the music he makes depicted as particularly sophisticated? No. It's more of what he listens from uh, the ambience. Uh, 
Yeah, like, you know, for nature sounds and things like that, right? On the first page, right, we're told that he makes rough songs. And he has a rugged harp of wood and the sinews of bears. We know that he is drawn to the sea. And that he is loved by this sea deity, Olmo, right? And I think that we can probably oppose this to the depiction of Melko. So, so Melko is clearly associated with fire and metal. And I think that a lot of what we're getting in the description of Tuor, and correct me if you think I'm wrong about this, is wood and water. Particularly before he comes to Gondola. Right. He lives by a lake. Yeah, he always keeps the water on his right side. Yeah, and he's almost always, wherever he goes, he's almost always close to water, right? Mm -hmm. When he begins his journeys, when he's following the swans, right? He is bearing his harp and his spear. So we've got a sense here that this is someone who is skilled in hunting and warfare, but for whom that's not everything, right? All right, there's someone who has a strong aesthetic sense in addition to skill in warfare. Now I want to talk a little bit about the journey that he makes. Did you notice any particular patterns in his journey? I want to note first that he starts out in a place called the Land of Shadows. And then a little bit further down the first page of this, right? Thereafter it is said that magic and destiny led him on a day to a cavernous opening, opening down which a hidden river flowed from Mithra. And Tuor entered that cavern seeking to learn its secret. But the waters of Mithra drove him forward into the, into the heart of the rock, and he might not win back into the light. And this, it is said, was the will of Olmo, Lord of Waters, at whose prompting when Oldoli had made that hidden way. Does this, is this part of a larger pattern in Two Wars Travels? You always, almost always there. And mm -hmm. he's influencing certain events. Like yeah. He influenced the Oldoli to make this cavern and keep it hidden. Uh-huh. And in a way, you know, the water's pushing him on. No, this is not for you. Yeah, the water put the water pushes like, like a river. You know, the two are never goes back, right? He only goes forward. Now I think this might also be related to the fact that Tuor is a mortal man, right? Not an immortal elf. So his sense of time is about, entirely about going forward as well, right? So like a river and like mortal time, he always goes forward. But I think what I, was, what I wanted to note here was the caverns, right? 
he's frequently he's frequently depicted going like when he goes into a new place, right? He almost always goes through a cavern and then comes out the other side. So there are a couple of things, I think, a couple of ways we might read this, right? One is that the caverns are like wombs from which Tuor is kind of born from some kind of old life and a new life, right? Uh, a common psychoanalytic reading of the cavern, especially a cavern with water in it, is as a kind of womb uh, situation, right? Okay, I thought I just had a dirty mind, but I had that thought whenever he was coming out of the ravine. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I thought, okay, yeah. maybe I'm just reading too much. Yeah, I mean, fine, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. if I change, he's always different when he, when he comes out. Yeah, and I think, like, this is a thing, like, when we, we'll, we'll note um, at the beginning of The Hobbit, at the beginning of The Lord of the Rings, right, where our unformed hero lives in this, you know, warm, safe hole in the ground and then has to emerge out into the light, right? I mean, Hobbit hole is like... Yeah. <laughs> the description of a, read the description of a Hobbit hole and then, like, when you're watching the movies. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a, it, 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 that, a, a fairly common interpretation of the Hobbit hole is that it is a kind of... It, it, that it's, it's basically a uterus. And, you know, Bilbo and Frodo both really kind of start out as man children, right? They're both about 50 years old when their adventures start. I mean, so they've been, they've been hanging around the womb a little too long. You're, you're, you're still considered a child until you're 30 with the hobbits. Yeah, so. yeah. Uh -huh. that's true. Yeah, it's a, a very, very you're long like 20 minority. year olds. Yeah. <laughs> so the other thing that I want to, and I think like this is something that particularly strikes me in that his place of origin is called the Land of Shadows. How familiar are you guys with Plato's allegory of the cave? Not at all. Okay, so I'm gonna to try to be brief about this, but um, just bear with me for a minute. Okay, so Plato argues that Essentially, all things in the physical, sensible world are merely imitations of ideas, right, that exist in the mental realm. So we can have something like a table here, we can have a desk, because we have an idea of a desk, and this can imitate that idea in the physical world, right? So he explains this in part through um, a kind of a thought experiment, right? So he, what Plato asks you to do is imagine a group of prisoners who live in a cave. Right? These prisoners are all chained up so their heads are facing forward. All they can see is the back of the cave. Now, on the back of the cave, they see all of these images, uh, so you have dancing, performing in front of them. Behind them, which they can't see, is a causeway. With a fire, and parading around in front of this fire, are puppeteers who are holding objects that cast shadows on the wall. So to these prisoners, all they know, like their only reality, is the shadows they see on the wall. Now suppose one of these prisoners breaks free and manages to get out of the cave. Initially, he'll be blinded by the bright light, but as his eyes adjust and he becomes more comfortable in his surroundings, he'll see that this is the real world, right? There is actually this bigger reality 
outside the cave that none of his friends have any idea about. And so he's got to run back and tell them. But of course, when he does run back and tell them, right? Guys, there's a world out there. <laughs> they don't believe him. And they just keep going on, you know, praising each other on interpretation of the shadows. So I think, particularly because his point of origin is the land of shadows, I think that some of what's going on here is you know, a kind of notion that Tuor is being introduced to higher and higher levels of reality as he um, goes from cave to cave, right? So, you know, first, you know, he escapes the land of shadows um, and ends up in the golden cleft of the rainbow roof, right? Then he goes through another cavern and he ends up by the sea. Then he has to go through a cavern where he hears voices and footsteps, right? So he act, there's actual illusions of some sort in that last cavern, the way of escape, in order to get into Gondolin. And I think that's another thing that's kind of interesting about the way Gondolin is depicted. Somewhat that the way in is called the way of escape. Escape from what? Threats of reality? Yeah. Melko's no. influence? Yeah. Particularly escape from Melko, right? But also, yeah, kind of escape. from the wider world and its troubles. Right, if we look at the speech that Tuor delivers to Turgon when he arrives, so they have this conversation starting on page 55. Right, then Turgon, king of Gondolin, robed in white with a belt of gold and a coronet of garnets was upon his head, stood before his doors and spoke from the head of the white stairs that led thereto. Welcome, O man of the land of shadows. Lo, thy coming was set in our books of wisdom, and it has been written that there would come to pass many great things in the homes of the Gondothleen, when so thou first faredst hither. Then spoke to her, and almost said power in his heart and majesty in his voice. Behold, O father of the city of the stone, I am bidden by him who maketh deep music in the abyss, and who knoweth the mind of elves and men, to say unto thee that the days of release draw nigh. There have come to the ears of Olmo whispers of your dwelling and your hill of vigilance against the evil of Melko, and he is glad. But his heart is wroth, and the hearts of the valor are angered who sit in the mountains of Valinor and look upon the world from the peak of Tanaquetil, seeing the sorrow of the thraldom of the Noldoli, and the wanderings of men. For Melko ringeth them in the land of shadows beyond the hills of iron. Therefore have I been brought by a secret way to bid you number your hosts and prepare for battle for the time is right. So what is Tuor telling Turgon, the valor told him to do? To seek him out and prepare for battle. Yeah, go fight, right? Go rescue your captive brethren. for which you've been providing this way of escape anyway, right? Basically leaving it up to them to get away and find a way into your city. Then spoke Turgon, that will I not do, though it be the words of Olmo and all the valor. I will not adventure my people against the terror of the orcs, nor imperil my city against the fire of Melko. 
So when he talks about my people in my city, who is it clear he doesn't include? But yeah, but yeah, the, those other Noldoli in the hells of the hells of iron are in the land of shadows, right? The Noldoli who have been dominated by Melko. So my people, my city, refers only to Gondolin and the Gondothleen, right? Turgon takes no responsibility for anyone else. Oh, you shouldn't have gotten captured. Not my problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, that's kind of, kind, of, kind of the attitude here, right? Then spoke to her, Nay, if thou dost not now dare greatly, then will the orcs dwell forever and possess in the end most of the mountains of the earth and cease not to trouble both elves and men, even though by other means the valor contrive hereafter to release the Noldoli. But if thou trust now to the valor, Though terrible the encounter, then shall the orcs fall, and Melko's power be minished to a little thing. But Turgon said that he was king of Gondolin, and no will should force him against his counsel to imperil the dear labor of long ages gone. But Tuor said, for thus was he bidden by Olmo, who had feared the reluctance of Turgon, that I am bidden to say that men of the Gondothleen repair swiftly and secretly down the river Syria to the sea, and there build them boats and go back, go seek back to Valinor. Lo, the paths thereto and the f are forgotten, and the highways faded from the world, and the sea and mountains are about it. Yet still dwell there the elves on the hill of Kor, and the gods sit in Valinor, though their mirth is minished for sorrow and fear of Melko. And they hide their land and weave about it inaccessible magic that no evil come to its shores. Yet still might thy messengers win there and turn their hearts that they rise in wrath and smite Melko and destroy the hells of iron that he has wrought beneath the mountains of darkness. So the only other path for him, he's saying, it, uh, for them, he's saying, is to go seek out the undying lands you originally came from that you've forgotten the way back to and that is also, like your city, shrouded in <clears throat> enchantments and mystery so that people can't can find it. And then maybe... Maybe you can beg the gods to come and do something about this. But Turgon again refuses, right? So, <clears throat> well, yeah, uh, are, are you, did you have something you wanted to say? No, I was just reading what Turgon was saying. Ah, okay. <laughs> so I think like one thing to note about Tuor and the role he plays in all of this is that Tuor is only, at least you know, by elvish standards, only kind of half civilized, right? If we look on page 52, the physical description we get of him there, right? Now there's a sally from the gates of Gondolin, and a throng comes about these twain in wonder, rejoicing that yet another of the Noldoli has fled hither from Melko, and marveling at the stature and the great limbs of Tuor, his heavy spear barbed with fishbone and his great heart. Rugged was his aspect, and his locks were unkempt, and he was clad in the skins of bears. It is written that in those days the fathers of the fathers of men were of less stature than men now are, and the children of Elphinus of greater growth, yet Tuor was taller than any that stood there. So, does Tuor look at all familiar to us? I think the association with bears might be important. Yeah. Beowulf, right? The bee wolf, right? The bear. Tuor is also a bear hero. And one thing we will find. Um, <clears throat> As we get to the Hobbit and the Lord of the Rings, right, even as Tolkien continued to develop this mythology, he kind of despaired of any of it ever actually being published. So a lot of the tropes and even certain set scenes from these early texts make their way into the Hobbit and the Lord of the Rings. Um, 
So we will see, for example, bear heroes um, in the very, at the very least in The Hobbit, right? But yeah, this is um, Tolkien's first use of the trope in his description of Tuor. Now speaking of heroes generally, um, I'm going to give you a set of theoretical principles um, that certain scholars have used historically to talk about literary heroes. Um, so the stuff I'm about to give you comes from a book by a Canadian critic by the name of Northrop Fry called Anatomy of Criticism. So Fry publishes this book in 1957. So this scheme is a little old fashioned. Um, it's um, not exactly in style with literary critics right now. And you know, if I'm being perfectly honest, um, it's a little reductive. Um, I'm not a huge fan of this particular schema, but I think it can be useful for talking about the kinds of heroes we encounter in um, the work of Tolkien and other fantasy writers. So, <clears throat> Fry defines a hero in terms of his or her relationship both to other people and to the environment. So the earliest phases of literary creation, um, Fry terms myth. And in a myth, the hero is superior in kind to other people and the environment, right? So the hero is like a god or a demigod, right? A superhuman. So like um, if Ulmo was performing most of the action in this rather than simply spurring the hero on, right? then this would be you know, a, a constructed myth rather than a sort of cultural myth, but a myth nonetheless, right? Romance, capital R, Fry describes as being about a hero who is superior in degree to other people. Right, so a human hero who is of high status and is able to do marvelous things. Right, so think, you know, like you know, Sir Lancelot in medieval romances, right, or Sir Galahad, right? Characters like this. The third phase Fry calls high mimetic. Right, mimesis is a Greek word that means imitation. So in the high mimetic, we have a hero who is superior in degree to others, but not to the environment, right? Essentially, our hero is a high-status normal person, a king or a prince or a general, right? This particular uh, style of hero Fry associates with epic and tragedy. So say somebody like Oedipus in uh, Sophocles' plays, right? You know, Oedipus is a king and is a powerful high status person, but he only has the capabilities of a normal person. 
Um, you know, same, you know, like, you know, Hector in the Iliad, right? Or even, you know, like, you know, Odysseus in the Odyssey. Um, they're, not, they're not superhuman. The fourth, and this is going to come into play a little bit more when we start talking about the Hobbit. Fry calls low mimetic. And the low mimetic hero is essentially an ordinary person. Right. No special status, no special abilities, just an ordinary person. So realism would be an example of a low mimetic literary style. And finally, my personal favorite, the ironic, in which we have a hero who is inferior to others and to the environment. So think of something in this case uh, like, uh, like a lot of modernist literature works this way. So think of something like Kafka's Metamorphosis, right? Where our hero um, is a traveling salesman who's been transformed into a cockroach and can barely get around his room, can't communicate with anyone, right? Um, and is stuck kind of desperately trying to cling to the last elements of a human life. So if we're looking at this in terms of this particular scheme, where do we think this falls, at least so far? We've already noted that it can't, it's not really myth, right, because Tuor isn't superhuman. He's not, like, <clears throat> he's not necessarily civilized or to any degree of valor at this point. He's just more ordinary. Yeah. Well, but it, is he really ordinary? He's been singled out by a god, right? And as soon as he gets to Gondolin, everybody there seems to recognize, like, whoa, this guy's awesome. <laughs> Maybe a combination of high mimetic and low mimetic. Like, he just starts out as an ordinary person, mm -hmm. not really interested in fighting. He just wants to play his harp and live his life. And then he's singled out by these uh -huh. gods to go and warn this community, hey, you either uh -huh. get ready to fight or die. Yeah, he has this, we didn't know that he has this prophetic function as well, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, we'll, 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 we'll see how this develops over time. I just kind of wanted to introduce some of these ideas to you. Um, because I think they will help us in reading a lot of Tolkien's work. Um, though I'm not sure they're going to be too much helpful. They're not going to be too, too helpful just reading anything else, but... <laughs> um, so... Let's look at what becomes of Tuor as he spends more time among the people of Gondolin. Right, if we go to page 58, now, Tuor learned many things in those realms, taught by Voronwe whom he loved, and who loved him exceeding greatly in return, or else he was instructed by the skilled men of the city and the wise men of the king. Wherefore, he became a man far mightier than aforetime, and wisdom was in his counsel. And many things became clear to him that were unclear before, and many things known that are still unknown to mortal men. Then he heard concerning that the city of, that city of Gondolin and how unstaying labor through ages of years had not sufficed to its building and adornment, where it folk travailed yet. Of the delving of that hidden tunnel he heard, which folk named the way of escape, and how there had been divided counsels in that matter, yet pity for the enthralled Moldoli had prevailed in the end to its making. Of the guard without ceasing, he was told, that was held there in arms and likewise at certain low places on the encircling mountains, and how watchers dwelt ever vigilant on the highest peaks of that range beside builded beacons ready for fire. For never did that folk cease to look for an onslaught of the orcs, did their stronghold become known. Now, however, was the guard of the hills maintained rather by custom than necessity, 
for the Gondothleem had long ago with unimagined toil leveled and cleared and delved all that plain about Amon Glareth, which means the Hill of Watch, right? So that scarce gnome or bird or beast or snake could approach was espied from many leagues off. For among the Gondothleem were many whose eyes were keen in the very hawks of Manwe Salimo, Lord of Gods and Elves who dwelled upon Tenequeto, right? So what do we notice about um, security in Gondolin? It's pretty. It's built up, but yeah. it's lazy. Well, it's not yeah. lazy. Yeah, it's tight, but it is also kind of complacent, right? Yeah. This matters in part because what we've got in Gondolin is this kind of pleasure garden, right? The city itself is described on page 54. Um, right Now, the streets of Gondolin were paved with stone and wide, curved with marble, and fair houses and courts amid gardens of bright flowers were set about the ways, and many towers of great slenderness and beauty, builded of white marble, and carved most marvelously rose to the heaven. Squares there were lit with fountains in the home of birds that sang amid the branches of their aged trees. But of all these, the greatest was that place where stood the, king, the king's palace, and the tower thereof was the loftiest in the city. And the fountains that played before the doors shot twenty fathoms and seven in the air and fell in a singing rain of crystal. Therein did the sun glitter splendidly by day, and the moon most magically shimmered by night. The birds that dwelt there were of the whiteness of snow and their voices sweeter than a lullaby of music. So this is a beautiful place, right? It's a kind of paradise. Right, where nature and design live and work hand in hand. But this is only maintained through constant vigilance, right? Now, I think we introduced the idea um, early in the semester of pastoral. Does anybody remember what pastoral was? I think when we were talking about Georgian poetry and the myth of England, we talked a little bit about this. Oh, it was how like like you see when the king lived the king lived in the center of a town and then later on moved outwards up on a hill. Oh, okay, I think you're, you're thinking you're thinking of the Anglo Saxon yeah. versus the Norman like uh, sort of town design, right? And yeah, this the king this is a more Anglo Saxon design when the king lives in the city. Um, so pastoral is this notion of this kind of peaceful, usually but not always, rural world that is undisturbed by earthly concerns. But pastoral is, on the one hand, artificial, right? Um, one thing that we noted in that passage um, Described in security, there is that like that you know, they're constantly at work on Gondolin, right? It's a work in progress. So pastoral is artificial, and it is also constantly under threat, right? The fantasy is delicate, and its borders are always threatened. So I want you to try to think about, like, as you read the remainder of this, I want you to think about Gondolin in these terms, right? Is this kind of fantasy retreat from the world that is constantly under peril, right? And we'll maybe sort of, like, tease that theme out a little bit more um, 
next time. But since we started, uh, since we started about ten minutes early, we're uh, we're about out of time now. So let me give you the reading questions for next time. What's that? You're, uh -huh. Yes, you're in this artificial paradise, and yeah, it's beautiful, and everyone's la di da, rainbows and unicorns. Uh -huh. but at the same time, you have like this constant you, anxiety yeah. of, oh crap, we're going to be attacked at any minute. Uh -huh. Exactly, you're always looking over your shoulder. Yeah, you couldn't be happy. Uh huh. Well, and I think that part of the idea of pastoral is that happiness itself is a fragile thing. And um, I think the, the idea is to kind of like, you know, treasure the moments when you have them. 